Hey everyone, my name is Nathan Payne. Welcome to another episode of Blue Ocean Crypto. Today we're going to do a AMA recap that was recently done by Heroes of Mavi and the team. They covered quite a bit. They talked about marketing, what's going on on the art side of things. They addressed a lot of the questions that had come up from the Ruby model and also gave us a sneak peek of the updated game deck, which is also now out and available. I definitely recommend you guys go watch or listen to the entire thing. It's about almost two hours long. There's also some slides from Marco who covered the marketing section and then some awesome stuff from Avon talking about art and VFX and what we have to look forward to. But I just wanna give you guys kind of a short and sweet condensed version. So I've got some notes here. I'm gonna be referencing throughout it. I've gone through the whole thing about three and a half times. You know, I went back kind of that last time just to highlight some key things that I thought were really important. And there's even something I missed the first time or two and live that I'm gonna to highlight for you guys which is really sweet for alliances so first off they started with the phase two beta recap there's 14,000 active users going strong obviously this is an overwhelming success for the beta more and more people are going to be let in as we continue here and it's really exciting just to have so many opponents to fight against um, they said that they had a lot of positive feedback to give us on how well the beta reporting has been going. So keep that up, guys. It's really helping them kind of identify a lot of the different issues on different devices. So they really wanted to give us their thanks with that. So that was really nice. And there's over 300,000 people on the wait list. That's insane, guys. I think this is kind of a hint of what's to come. They did also want to give us some updates on their partnerships. All their partners are currently thrilled with Mavia's direction and how things are going right now. So that's always good news to hear. Uh, the spotlight is on player growth, esports plans, and tournaments. Now, anyone in the BOG Alliance or a lot of you guys on the competitive side, this is obviously super great news. We know this is the kind of game that can really focus on esports and competitive play. There's also new initiatives for creators and ambassadors of the underway, setting the stage for Mavia's dominance in mobile gaming. They talked about how there's going to be a whole new ambassador to Discord, and there's going to be all kinds of awesome incentives for people creating content just like us. That's really exciting to hear about. The first person that we heard from was Marco. And he talked a lot about the marketing side of things. I will be doing a separate video deep diving just into this marketing plan. Uh, I definitely have a lot of insight, you know, as a marketing consultant myself working with Web3 Project. Now, just a little background on Marco. He's a veteran in user acquisition, which sheds lights on Mavia's potential to go viral. And he really focused on how everything has to do with data-driven marketing, right? So everything that's being used or focused on is really data driven. Now, if you take a look at some of the slides here, they talk about what is Mavia, strategy, builder battle game, multiplayer game, PVP. Like I said, I'm gonna rip through this, just cover kind of the highlights that he mentioned. He's focusing on the iconic IP. Really the priorities right now is target audience. They talked about how they are currently running ads and they are actually getting cost per acquisition much lower than industry standard. So that's really exciting for them to see. Uh, that obviously shows that there's a lot of potential to have a great launch and really have a massive player base kind of kick off pretty quickly. Uh, they do talk about what the core sub core and potential focus of the audience is, you know, between a certain age, male users, mobile users, you know, obviously there's exceptions to this, but they were talking about how they're really kind of honing in on these target audiences. Also, they talk about their go to market roadmap. He was just saying how important this was different objectives with user engagement, retention, uh, also, you know, driving awareness, driving engagement, conversions and virality. I really liked hearing from Marco. You could tell he knew what he was talking about. He's obviously an expert at this. It's really nice for me having a marketing background, hearing some insight from someone on the team about really what they're doing and how they're using this data-driven approach. It just kind of adds to the whole aspect of we knew all these other components of the team were crushing it, development's crushing it, art's crushing it, community's crushing it. There's been a lot of questions about the marketing, right? And uh, OT in the Discord has been awesome for community engagement tweeting stuff but it's nice to see kind of the team a little bit bigger right he was even sharing some of our content on discord which is really cool but yeah I'm really excited to hear from Marco uh, they talked about content and creative you know trailers UA videos UA statistics and then once again just going back to the objectives 
launch, you know, awareness campaigns, traffic engagement, ad promos, you know, learning from all that, taking the data, amping up the marketing and kind of scaling it as we go. And then of course, optimizing it. They have some estimates. This is really cool. I want to spend a little bit minute, a little minute on this. Global launch, they're aiming for 1.5 million users. Now you can see there's soft launch at 50, then UA is 208,000. Then there's the global launch you know, for brand, which is free, and then, which is 450,000, and then UA is 1.5 million. So really I'm looking at that 1.5 million. That's pretty exciting for me to think about. If Mavia can still get things out in November, I mean, I'm not sure if that's still gonna happen. Of course, you know, in Web3, we're all used to delays and I don't think anyone would want them to rush it, but man, that's gonna be amazing to hit. Plus there are 300,000 on the wait list already. It makes it feel like that 1.5 isn't really that far away, you know? So that was kind of the main thing from Marco. Um, now, just talking about the ambassador program a little bit. I kind of highlighted it quickly in the beginning. It's a dedicated Discord for the Mavia creative community. The goal is to amplify creators, expand the player base and orchestrate events. Basically, this is going to allow Mavia to have a place to deal with and coordinate between all the content creators and ambassadors and just keep things organized. There isn't going to be any first hand information in there or any kind of like alpha being leaked so people in the regular score don't have to worry about oh i need to be in there just to understand what's going on in the game it's really just for them to help coordinate with content creators and ambassadors i'm looking forward to getting involved with that uh, also it's going to be launching imminently and with promotions across all kinds of different platforms this is going to be super sweet and i do know that their creator code program which is something that was kind of briefly touched on that's not until after global watch now avon jumped in and man you can tell this guy is absolutely passionate about the game i think he was a real spotlight during this ama i mean not only is the guy just creatively brilliant, what he's bringing to the table and all the inspiration and things that he's doing with Mavia has never been done before, right? He talked about death animations, how new VFX are coming in soon, the land decorations. He talked about how there's gonna be things like when you're attacking the three stars that come up, there's gonna be skins and cosmetics for that that make it unique, kind of like Rocket League, where when you score, there's like a special emote or special thing that happens that you can only get. So you're gonna have different ways to flex your cosmetics. I think Avon really did a good job at shedding light on just how much potential there actually is for these skins and cosmetics. Land decorations that only landowners can get. Even defensively, he talked about like buildings being destructed and balloons popping out or candy popping out or different kind of animations. So it's not just going to be when someone randomly finds your base. You know, there's going to be lots of opportunities to kind of promote or use your cloak with the skins that you've got and kind of brag or flex. That's really cool. Now he has some slides that you guys can download too. Make sure you zoom in to really see. It kind of shows a lot with the characters and I'll just kind of go through it here quickly, but I'm not going to zoom in so you guys can read the finer details. You know, that I recommend you go download it, but it just shows a lot of the different effects with like the ice tower, the rocket tower, the motor. He goes into uh, the big king, big axe king kind of whirlwind, how that skill works. There was one for dodge king, um, gorilla king, you know, went through all the heroes and I, I do recommend you download this. So you can really zoom in and see all the details and kind of read it. I also really liked how they showed the, the death animations. So there's going to be post death effects and he's talking about how it's going to be unique based on all the different characters. So you're going to kind of know where they died. I think that's going to be interesting for the attack uh, strategy, kind of knowing, okay, my hero died here. How is that going to impact this? Really awesome to see. Now they talk about the mission buildings. So these, you know, all those little structures on the land aren't going to be use useless. You know, they're going to have people in them. They're going to be missions. There's going to be things to do. There's Dr. Rubicon and the research station. There's Tom and the old mine. So there's a lot of different characters like this that he was really introducing to us to kind of show that there's going to be more of this narrative and story and missions and almost like single player aspect to the game, which is really cool. Raven in the warehouse, Ava in the Ruby workshop, Sterling in the Ruby marketplace. I noticed Sonny's using this profile picture in Discord right now. So as soon as I seen that and then him switch it, I was like, aha. Uh -huh. And I really like this slide. It shows the playable area. It shows where, ra where rare unlockable decorations are going to be going to be where the mission buildings are, are and then where legendary decorations can go so you're really going to be able to build 
maybe not build, but have things surrounding your base in a way that's going to make bases truly unique. It's not like Clash where every single base looks very similar or the same. Um, he showed a lot more kind of art concepts on some of the, the land decorations and the statues. And just kind of going down here, it's a little difficult to zoom in and see kind of all the details on this where he's got like the pirate the cyberpunk the armor the 70s and halloween but go download those slides so you can you know zoom in yourself and really kind of see what that's all about which is pretty cool they talked about color schemes lots of great stuff here tristan jumped in and uh there was quite a few things that he covered he kind of went through the game deck and then answered a bunch of questions i'm going to make sure to highlight all these questions individually i have them in a nice list so first game aesthetics revamped with a fresh logo i really like it i think it's awesome how they did this obviously you know a lot of this is still similar just with the updated graphics same with the gameplay they changed the markswoman there uh, this is very similar one thing i want to highlight remember it says deploy traps a lot of people have been talking about that there's no traps is there going to be traps it's right here guys so i can't wait for that as a base builder myself this is the main thing though as soon as we hit this slide it was like okay let's slow down and listen so there's Mavia, which is the governance token, in-game rewards, real money skill-based gaming token. This is huge. This is something that was covered, but maybe a lot of people didn't kind of absorb exactly what it is. This ensures compliance because the gambling's not allowed, right? But real money skill-based gaming is. And actually some of the most downloaded games right now are ones that are involved with this. Uh, Mavi is not an in-game resource. They talk about Ruby, it crafts legendary items. We all know that. We used to trade legendary items, earn through gameplay and challenges, cannot be bought or sold directly. And then Sapphire, which is the premium in-app currency used for speed ups and building character boosts, cannot be sold or exchanged, uses a small fee in legendary item trades. Important detail here. They talked about how that small fee is actually what allows them to stay compliant with Apple. So when you're using Ruby and you're doing these trades and there's this one, you know, small little Sapphire fee, that helps them with the compliance. Now, for the average player doing maybe a couple of these a week, you're gonna find a few Sapphire, you know, when you're removing obstacles. You're not gonna have to be purchasing Sapphire to facilitate this. You know, they do talk about how this makes it fun for everyone. They want it to be disproportionately advantageous for landowners, but not exclude free to play players. If you exclude all the free to play players, people are gonna be upset. They're gonna feel like they're missing out. It's gonna be hard to catch up. This way, it's for everyone. Free to play players can mint you know, these NFTs as well. But of course, being a land over has a lot of disproportional benefits. So it incentivizes renting, owning lands, other things like that. And they really kind of boil it down to this land NFTs, skins, cosmetics, decorations, statues and consumables. And then legendary items and Ruby use cases. They went through this quickly. I think, you know, troop themes, building themes, legendary statues, the statues are really important. And actually one of the explanations that they used was, let's say someone does a microtransaction through Apple Pay or Google or Google or on their credit card or through Strike, you know, it's a microtransaction with fiat. They would purchase this statue, which by the way, is only available on the Ruby marketplace. You can't use Sapphire to get this. It's purchased with fiat, gets converted to ETH and then pays the Web3 owner on the back end in crypto. This is a lot of the uses right now, but there's more use cases. They really want our feedback on how to make this better and how to find more use cases because the more demand there is for these, the more successful the game will be overall. And it really helps everybody in the entire ecosystem. Uh, they also talk about tournament entry fees. This is gonna be huge. This is a big way to burn Ruby. Also, the wager matches, right? So that's something that's kind of mentioned here, but not really, and that's gonna be huge. They talk about ways to earn, Winning, defense, moving obstacles, wager matches, here they are. Uh, I think this is not to be understated. I've been talking and promoting wager matches forever. I think this is massive. Doesn't matter what's going on in the market. Even when we have the old model, I was like, who cares? You know, $1,000 in Ruby is $1,000 in Ruby. Uh, you know, we can wager that up. But now Ruby's an in-game currency. It's not you know, a cryptocurrency. So this is gonna be huge for esports. Partnering base with other players, this is basically a renting, completing challenges. I'm gonna do a deep dive on this, but I just wanted to cover the main points that Tristan went over in here. Talk about additional engineers, some of the other Sapphire use cases. You know, there is some cross aspects, you know, things that legendary, or sorry, Ruby mimics, you know, a legendary consumables might mimic some of the Sapphire use cases. They, so they went through that. They said, this is still pretty much the same. There's gonna be demand on renting and partnerships and of course one of the questions are going goes into that directly this is the ruby marketplace now they said on 
on Android, it's going to be very simple. So no problem there. iOS is the one that's going to take a little bit more work. Now, even if you tap it, it opens up a browser and brings you there to make the microtransaction. That's still kind of in app still, just like with Instagram, when you tap on an ad and it brings up a browser, you're still really in the Instagram app. So even if that has to be done, it's not a big deal. But of course, they're aiming for everything really to just be within the game. You can buy with ETH, you can buy with Fiat and of course, Ruby for a lot of these things. So really they talk about how uh, landowners stand to gain significantly more Ruby. The Ruby marketplace is a blend of aesthetics and utility ensuring compliance with app store regulations. They talk about, he mentioned how all the gas fees are covered. All trades are fully on chain and visible. Lots of great stuff with this. This is the thing that really got me pumped. Real money skill based gaming. They're allowed to do this because it's not gambling. And there's even gonna to be tournaments for the Mavia token. They even talked about Alliance wager matches, which I think that was a recommendation or suggestion I put in probably like a year or a little year and a half ago. So I'm super stoked to hear that. Think about massive 50 v 50 wars with huge rubies up for grabs, but then the tournaments for the Mavia token. This is kind of how we can win cryptocurrency and real money and value from these tournaments. And then they even talked about how like there'd be a rake. So with a rake, you know, there might be like a 5% fee that rake can go back to feed into the ecosystem and then we can vote using the Mavia token because it's a governance token on what that gets used for. Does it get used for more tournaments? Does it go back to landowners in some way? So really interesting to hear about that. But the main thing is these guys made a model that was compliant. They want our feedback on how to make it better and how to add more value to Ruby and add more value to landowners. So once again, they talked about the government. So I just kind of mentioned this briefly, proposal based voting, ecosystem and game decisions, and you know yes this isn't on pc this is a mobile only device they talked about how on pc it's actually easier to bot and cheat uh, and mobile is really the focus i've been mentioning this for a long time you're going to severely handicap yourself if you try to find a way to play it on pc because with multi-touch you need to have those multiple fingers using a mouse no way you know people used to use blue stacks on clash of clan we wouldn't even let them into our alliance if we found out they were doing that because we knew they were severely handicapped and they wouldn't be able to compete. So I'm just glad that they've really honed this in and they're like, yes, it's mobile, it's Apple, it's Google, period. The, they're, talk, they're still going to focus on, you know, these cutting end features. This is pretty much similar from before. They're already running ads right now, like I mentioned. So they said that uh, they were doing better than industry standard for cost per acquisition. So things are going really well and position, positioning them for global launch to really kind of ramp up the marketing. The tokenomics is pretty much the same. They mentioned how they added some art and then the updated roadmap. Now, like I said, I'll do a deep dive on this game deck. I kind of just wanted to cover the main things that Tristan went over. Um, There's a couple other things. The Ruby Marketplace is a hub of aesthetics and functionality. Now, Avon actually jumped in and he was talking about how uh, there needs to be seasonal competitions with these fire bases. And it's inspired by Path of Exile, which promised fresh seasonal experiences. The game's adaptability ensures players both old and new remain engaged. Because engaged. Because one of the most impressive things about Path of Exile is it's constantly been growing. How are they doing that? There's new seasons that are introduced every 11 weeks. There's always new features. Everyone gets to start from the same base point. Like in Clash of Clan, if you start now, you're so far behind, good luck. You're never going to get to the competitive level. It's just impossible. This would solve that. People, you know, there's standard season. You still have your main base. This is like a secondary base. But now everyone gets to start fresh seasonally and all compete together. I think this is really, really smart and also exciting. It's going to push the competitive scene to a whole new level. It's going to allow new players to get in and not have this five-year runway that they can't eventually catch up to because the game's been out for so long. It's really cool how you jumped in and kind of mentioned that. Uh, they also talk about how players have in-game avenues to acquire Sapphire for Ruby transactions, which once again ensures compliance with app stores and community feedback. So the team really cherishes all the feedback. They wanted to make sure that we noticed, you know, no one's been kicked. They haven't deleted messages. They really want us to figure out how to work together with them to provide constructive feedback, but they want us to keep in mind that all of this has to be within compliance. You know, just saying things like, hey, we want to check from the revenue share. 
doesn't help them. How can we add value to Ruby? How can we add more value to landowners? And they were talking about how landowners, there's going to be, you know, disproportional advantage to them. You're going to be able to get these tickets to mint. There's going to be tournaments specifically to landowners only. There's going to be land decorations specific to landowners only. So it's not just an exclusive club. You do want all the free to play players to feel included, but we're still going to get a lot of benefits as landowners ourselves. And there's going to be incentives for those free to play players to bridge over to Web3 or do renting and partnering. Now, I wanna jump into the questions because I know that was a lot that we just covered and you can tell I'm super excited about all this stuff. So the first one was how can players earn Ruby the easiest? And the easiest was kind of like, well, what does that really mean when you ask that? But basically you gotta engage in in-game activities. You gotta use your land, you gotta rent your land, you gotta play the game. You can't just hold it and expect that you're gonna passively you know, gain Ruby. That was kind of the main point here. Also, they asked what benefits do landowners have? I kind of mentioned this before. Priority in tournaments, exclusive rewards, higher Ruby potential. Now they couldn't go into exactly what is that X factor, right? 5X, 10X, 15X, because that's a game balancing thing. And it can't really be set in stone. They have to work on that, but they want to make it so that it's in high enough that it's disproportionately advantageous to landowners, but also doesn't make free to play players feel like they have no chance. Uh, another question that someone asked was why rent? Uh, and you know a land basically what's the point anymore if a free-to-play player can earn ruby and really it's the enhanced earning rate and exclusive access people will want to rent these lands to get the ability to earn the ruby to mint special things that are coming up and they're also going to make sure it's not just these seasonal things or when these new mints come up everyone's rushing to rent land and then they let go of it they really want to keep that balance going and they're going to find lots of ways to help promote the renting and partnering i know there's a lot of us in our in the alliance and people who even watch this video who own a lot of lands we're not going to be able to play them all the renting and partnering has been a big focus and reason why a lot of us have picked up a lot of lands sounds like they got a good plan of attack here also they asked someone asked why the emphasis on skins and decorations right especially from the model beyond aesthetics they offer various use cases enhancing gameplay and they're the prettiest things to showcase it's just easy to show all these nice pictures of all these skins and cosmetics on media on content and Yes, maybe the, they agreed that the Ruby model didn't emphasize a lot of the other use cases as much. That's really the main reason. And with Avon kind of explaining the uniqueness of like Rocket League and how when you get the three stars, it's going to be unique animation. The fire bases are going to be unique. The destruction is going to be unique defensively. It really is going to be that when you run into a player's base, especially on the esports and the tournament side, it's going to be unique experience. I think there's a lot more here than people are expecting with the skins, but we're right. We don't have a model to compare it to. We don't have a game to really compare it to in the same way. Uh, someone asked, will players be forced to buy Sapphire for Ruby transactions? No, they can be found in game right go remove your obstacles get a couple sapphire that'll cover your transactions that keeps things compliant with apple you don't got to continually be buying sapphire in order just to feed all your ruby marketplace transactions um someone asked what are examples of legendary consumables instant upgrades extra shields shields that are better than regular ones game changing items there was even like a cairo bomb where it freezes thing kind of like the potions or spells in clash of clans but even better and then they were even thinking about a nuclear bomb where it just wipes someone out that's going to put a lot of demand on legendary consumables obviously another question and the second last one was can land be rented using fiat uh, ideally yes they want to be able to do that all within the app like i explained worst case scenario it'll open up a browser and they can do it there android is set easy to do there ios is the one that's going to take a little bit more work to get that ironed out and then the very last question was how to boost ruby's utility and demand basically the team seeks community brainstorming to enhance the marketplace and game success i've mentioned this a couple times through the recap they really want us to help give them feedback i feel like they have a really good plan of attack here but they're totally open to find more ways to add value to ruby to add more ways to add value to landowners and it was really exciting to see that they want this to be a collaborative process okay awesome guys i don't want this video to go too too long i hope that was a great recap for you thanks so much for joining me be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already to stay up to date with all the great mavia content that we have coming over for you guys on a consistent basis smash that like button so we can show this to lots of other people and help that youtube algorithm and until next time cheers